Okay, we're going to um, carry on for one more paper uh, before having a break. And I would like to introduce the next speaker. Uh, the next speaker is Parveen Adams, and the title of the paper is Becoming a Photograph, the case of Joel Peter Whitkin. Um, Harveen runs the psychoanalytic graduate program uh, at Brunel, um, is the, was the founding editor uh, of the feminist journal MF, um, part of which was then reprinted by MIT as The Woman in Question. Uh, she published recently the book The Emptiness uh, of the image and is now working on art, space and psychoanalysis and above all does not write on post-colonial discourse. <laughs> <laughs> those of you who don't know it, I just want to say that the images are very strong. They do involve photographs of dead bodies, fetuses, and uh, all sorts of deformities. I'm not sure what you can do about it except prepare yourself internally. Um, I found Mark's account of Freud uh, extremely interesting and productive this morning, but I have to say that the way that I am, <laughs> the way that the way that I am uh, using psychoanalysis to talk about Joel Peter Wittgen really is beyond the unconscious, and so in a sense, it's, it is beyond psychoanalysis. So then it comes and meets, I think, the task that Tony didn't quite perform, but he was exactly at that spot, uh, which I'm going to be talking about. On the other hand, what I'm going to be talking about has more than a touch of pathology in it. Okay. The title should really be uh, Turning Oneself into a Photograph. I am the work that I help to create, Joel Peter Wittgen says. These words, I think, are to be taken literally. Joel Peter Wittgen doesn't just make photographs. He makes photographs of himself. But this doesn't mean that he makes self-portraits. It is that in making the work, he makes himself. Indeed, he is only interested in photography insofar as it is about him, I quote. I am not interested in photography per se. I am dedicating myself to myself. This is my vocation. My understanding of Bitkin which is in general consonant with his own, rests on Lacan's late writings on James Joyce. According to Lacan, Joyce, it is Joyce who makes himself into a book. A book and a photograph are not the same thing, but if you are familiar with the 1975 seminar on Joyce, you might guess the direction my analysis will take. It concerns an unfamiliar and radical transformation of our idea of human beings. And by the same token, I think, our idea of psychic space. What you may be familiar with is Wittgen's use of dead fetuses and fragments of cadavers, of live dwarfs, preoperative transsexuals, those born with horns, wings, tails, or flippers, those with elephant, elephantine limbs, and so on. Three examples. Now, which button is it? The first, the kiss from 1982, is of a head split in half for an anatomy course. The second, portrait of a dwarf from 1987, 
Eugenia Parry Janis describes it. An adorable dwarf who played E.T. in Spielberg's film poses with the confident gaze of self-love in a satin mask and lace camisole. The third example, Las Meninas, 1987, is of a legless cripple atop a bare frame on wheels. According to Janis, the preparatory drawings for this picture is entitled, Me Crippled. What is going on with such an identification? How is Witkin crippled? What sets him aside from others? Of course, we rely on his own account of the matter. An early account made in his student days in New Mexico in the mid 70s. He tells the story of what befell him at the tender age of six. He is leaving the tenement he lives in with his mother and brother, and they hear a terrible sound of a crash and screams and cries for help. The accident had involved three families and cars. Witkin writes, at the place where I stood at the curb, I could see something rolling from one of the overturned cars. It stopped at the curb where I stood. It was the head of a little girl. I bent down to touch the face, to ask it. But before I could touch it, someone carried me away. Of course, Witkin will understand this as the primal scene of his work. As Witkin bends down to address the head of the girl, to question her, she is for him both alive and dead. And while it is a question of her body, at the same time, its pieces are flung in different directions. There is no longer a boundary separating her from the world. If you don't differentiate inside and outside, you don't exist. That head that rolled to the curb shattered the proper image of Joel Peter Witkin's body and put his existence in question. Witkin is not explicit about the disturbance in the relation to the image of the body, but he is quite explicit about its effect. I was confused by life, by its origination, continuation, and termination. It is as though he were the victim of the accident. So, Witkin crippled. Through his work, Witkin comes to have the feeling of having individual existence. He is clear about this, though he says that, quote, that is not exhaustively describable, nor for that matter, understandable, that it comes to have some individual existence. With, with a little help from Lacan, we, I hope, will understand how that is possible. But before we get to that, we should know something about Wittgen's methods of work and its effect on the viewer. I quote a long passage from Germano Salant's 1995 essay. Light, can it be high? <coughs> Will it stay high? Uh -huh. Here's a quote. Wittgen uses an inordinately tactile photography, one capable of creating a corporeal dimension in which images seem to spout. The very surfaces of his photographs thus return to epidermal values. It is almost as though, they, as though their skin, this skin, sight of the uncontrollable manifestations of existence, terrain of eroticism as well as necrophilia, is a threshold between outside and inside, between silence and screams, calm and violence. This is why it is often gouged with scratches and marks, both positive and negative, and printed through tissue paper onto portico paper using various chemicals to achieve different tones and layerings. Finally, with a camera obscura, this skin is aged, assuming, as it were, the tactility of an image having arisen from the earth. At times, the images are subjected to an encaustic process. After the print is archivally mounted on aluminium, Cynthia, that's his wife, hand tones the grains of the photographic surface with pigments. This process alone may take weeks to complete. Then the Witkins layer the print in pure molten beeswax and proceed later to reheat the wax again to a liquid state. The surface is then allowed to cool for several days and polished by hand. Through all these processes, the emulsified surface for the artist becomes the membrane 
on which the vibrations and impulses, the uncertainties and indecisions of a new life are registered. The photography is porous, impermeable, the seat of a deep perception at once physical and spiritual. It possesses the image and is possessed by it. In this sense, it approaches painting, merging with the artist's inner gaze. It is a piece of his skin which comes into being, grows, moving about like a living thing. I don't um, share the conceptual frame, but I find that an, an immensely uh, rewarding passage. We can now hazard a guess as to how it is that Wittgen comes to feel that he has an individual existence. Wittgen suffers a dis disturbance in the imaginary, a disturbance that involves his relation to the image of his own body. I suggest that he makes up for this by constructing not an image, but an ego through his picture making. This idea derives from Lacan's work on Joyce. Lacan writes about the disturbance of the imaginary in Joyce and about the way in which his writing builds a substitute imaginary in the form of the ego. Of course, this is no ordinary kind of writing. Lacan calls it écriture, and it is characterized as a writing in the real. That is to say that here, signification is beside the point. What counts is the jouissance of the mark. So we have a texture of writing that comes to be the ego that Joyce lacks. It is in this way that Joyce makes himself into a book. You can appreciate that this is no ordinary kind of ego. Similarly, Wittgen's construction of a photographic skin allows Wittgen to make himself into a photograph. This skin is not of the order of the image of the mirror stage. It has to do with the ego conceived as the space of the picture. The picture is Wittgen's ego. Sorry, I think I forgot to show you some slides. I wanted to show you three slides there to uh, really uh, stress the, the techniques that he uses. I think they're very clear what he does to negative. Three braces. So Wittgen feels better making pictures, but he still suffers. And certainly to viewers, the pictures are about horror and suffering. There is a rawness about them. I think this can be explained through both sides of the distinction I have just made between image and ego. The image retains and conveys the problem. The photographic surface should serve as its solution. But while the solution is not altogether successful even for Wittgen himself, insofar as he continues to suffer, for the viewer, it generates a new problem. Now the photographic skin is yours and you find yourself trapped in your new ego, confined to a narrow prosthetic space. <coughs> Jouissance is seldom very nice, even when it is the solution to a problem. Normally, we would expect art to have the function of transforming jouissance, of bringing it under the regulation of the symbolic and the imaginary. Here, we are dealing with a jouissance that has indeed been altered in some way, but that stubbornly remains outside meaning. Wittgen devises an existence for himself through the making of the picture, and simultaneously the problem of existence remains part of the picture. It is as though he had caught and trapped the problem into the frame of the picture. This gives him a degree of control, but leaves us at the mercy of the picture. I want to describe this uncomfortable space of Wittgen's pictures. I return to Germana Salan's text. The quality conferred by encaustic and impasti of soil projects a petrified sense. In a terrible discovery in which everything is transformed into relic and thing, into an unfathomable silence where the crust of the cosmos ceases to breathe as a life substance. Here, earth and mud are not regenerative, but serve rather to fix and seal. They enter the photograph's body like a tomb, if the language of the images represents a return to the earth, it also documents a descent into hell, into Hades, where it frees the dead 
and brings them back into circulation. Solant is noting the effects of the skin of the picture, that skin that I have identified as the Witkinian ego. That it is the space of the tomb doesn't detract from its function. It does, however, emphasize the restriction of space and the separation from the outside world. Somewhere, Witkin speaks of making enclosures. Of course, the womb is also an enclosure. Witkin is concerned precisely with both life and death, but he can only deal with their similarity and their differences in the special space he constructs in his pictures. The relation between life and death and the question of his own being is addressed in and through that space. It is a space not organized by the symbolic. The construction of the photographic skin has nothing to do with the other, capital O, the big other. Of course, the entry into the field of the other is necessary to the construction of our familiar habitual three-dimensional space. But Wittgen has not entered the field of the big other. And psychically speaking, he does not inhabit three-dimensional space. The photographic skin, the ego, signals a space that has no depth. It is a space that is best described as a thick surface. Paradoxically, precisely there, where traditionally there is no subject, Wittgen conjures up its appearance. How can the subject come to exist in the space of womb and tomb. The answer is that the ego that Wittgen constructs confers the status of subject. It is Wittgen's art that allows him this. Perhaps we can now see what the real dead fetus is doing in the picture. In a sense, it is Joel Peter Wittgen himself, for the fetus is the being of the subject in a non-symbolic form. Wittgen manages to accede to subjecthood by constructing the ego, the space of the photographic skin. Again, we see that the solution does not do away with the jouissance it operated upon. The solution organizes jouissance minimally, for this ego is outside the symbolic. I gave you Germano Solant's account of how Wittgen labors to construct his photographic skin. I suggest that it is something quite distinct in art. Is it possible to liken this photographic skin to what is sometimes referred to as the materiality of paint? Is the crust that Wittgen constructs akin to paint, qua paint? I think not. In Vermeer's painting, The Lace Maker, there is a famous patch where the skeins of different colored threads almost dissolve into pure paint, disconnected from the subject matter of the picture. This materiality of the paint interferes with the wholeness of the painting a gap opens up in the picture. This show, that shows us something of the intrication of real, imaginary, and symbolic in representation. It is the question of the freeing up of space. We can think of this as the everyday reality of the symbolic imaginary having too much of an upper hand, and the gap as a breathing space in which the viewer has a moment of freedom from that reality. In contrast, the space of Wittgen's pictures is a sealed space. Everyday reality is usurped by Wittgen's reality, the space of tomb and womb. We can think of this as Rissas having too much of the upper hand and the photographic skin as limiting and organizing its domain. But just as the gap in the Vermeer does not do away with everyday reality, so the photographic skin does not banish Rissas from Wittgen's picture. Here too, the picture lets us experience something of the way in which the three registers are knotted together, real, imaginary, and symbolic, but it is a different kind of knotting. The images in Wittgen's work are not structured like the Im images we are familiar with. Our familiar images are structured by the imaginary and the symbolic of the mirror stage. The other is in the picture, there is a three-dimensional space of the subject, and there is sense. Wittgen's images, on the other hand, are forged within the psychic space that he constructs and are subordinate to such space. The images thus become unfamiliar. This is consonant with the fact that he is not supplementing the disturbance at the level of the image of his body, but rather of the ego. He finds his measure of existence through the ego and jouissance becomes bearable for him. 
I wanted to talk a little about Lacan and Joyce and Ezekiel. It's a much, much, much shorter section, but I hope to make the point about what kind of an entity this ego is and why this ego is outside the unconscious. It should be clear by now that Lacan has invented a new kind of ego. It emerges from his analysis of James Joyce. Lacan reads Joyce's work as the construction of an ego. He reads the work as the construction of an ego, a solution to the problem of the failure of the paternal function. But crucially, this ego is a non oedipal solution to that failure. For the artist, the father still doesn't perform his function, and the viewer, for his part, begins to share the artist's problem. Writing from a Lacanian perspective, Luke Thurston speaks of the Joycean solution in terms of a prosthetic fourth register that bolts the subject in place. This fourth register is the ego that we have been speaking of. In order to grasp the idea of this prosthetic ego, something must be said about the way in which Lacan understands the problem of Joyce's existence and the way in which his writing constitutes a solution to it. An example to indicate the nature of the problem. It is an incident taken from the early novel, a portrait of the artist as a young man. It describes the occasion when Stephen, which Lacan always reads as Joyce, it describes the occasion when Stephen gets a thorough thrashing from his school friends after a discussion of heresy, and it is Stephen's response that Lacan emphasizes. On remembering this scene, he, Stephen, noted that, quote, the memory of it called forth no anger from him. Even that night, when he stumbled homewards along Jones Road, he had felt that some power was divesting him of that sudden woven anger as easily as a fruit is divested of its soft, ripe pea. We are talking about a dislocation of the image of the body, a disturbance in the mirror state. The ring of the imaginary has slipped out of the knot that it should have formed with the real and the symbolic. There is another example from the portrait which makes clear Stephen's way of dealing with this problem. It concerns the fetus, which we have already encountered in a different form in Wittgen's work. Stephen's father had taken him to his old college, Queens, where, with the help of the porter, he seeks his initials in the anatomy theatre. Stephen remains in the background, but, and I quote, on the desk he read the word fetus, cut several times in the dark stained wood. The sudden legend startled his blood. And walking back with his father, and I quote, he could scarcely recognize as his his own thoughts, and repeated slowly to himself, I am Stephen Dedalus. I am walking beside my father, whose name is Simon Dedalus. We are in Cork, in Ireland. Cork is a city. Our room is in the Victoria Hotel. Victoria and Stephen and Simon. Simon and Stephen and Victoria. Names. The memory of his childhood suddenly grew dim. He tried to call forth some of its vivid moments, but could not. He recalled only names. Dante, Parnell, Clay, Clombo. The story includes the father, who is always portrayed as failing in his function, the fetus, that is Stephen himself in a non-symbolic form, not yet having acceded to subjecthood, and the desperate holding on to names when meaning fails. And what is a name? It is the signifier in its aspect of the letter, of the mark that carries jouissance into the very heart of the symbolic. Stephen holds on to the symbolic and real when confronted <coughs> by the apparition of the fetus. This marks but does not resolve, resolve the problem of the non-existence of the subject. Joyce, Lacan says, will construct his ego and will weave an existence for himself through écriture, a writing in the real, which I will explain in one paragraph. Paradoxically, écriture involves a repetition of the failure of the paternal relation. The solution comes about through a repetition of failure. So you begin to see why the new idea of the ego that Lacan was elaborating feels strange. Joyce has claimed that both in Ulysses and in Finnegan's Wake, he used the material of conversations from everyday life. That is to say that he repeated what he had heard. 
In so doing, he makes meaning quite unimportant, opening up, as he does, a gap between the enunciation and the announced. Now, in the portrait, just such a gap exists for Stephen. He listens to what his father is saying to him and repeats the words he does not understand. For Stephen, the father is the voice of the father. Joyce listens to voices in the everyday places of his daily life, and without relating to what he is to what is being said, he uses what he has heard in his work. So Joyce is doing uh, what Stephen was doing. This relation of repetition is a hallmark of his art. He could only respond to whatever it was that his father's words did to him by repeating them. Joyce's art consists of the kind of repetition that can only be described as the repetition of the failure of the paternal relation. And yet, La Française, that this very repetition enabled the building of an ego that allows the knotting of the three registers that had come apart. A quotation from Ulysses comes to the support of Lacan's theory here. As we weave and unweave our bodies, Stephen said, from day to day, as we weave and unweave our bodies from day to day, their molecules shuttled to and fro, so does the artist weave and unweave his image. And as the mole on my right breast is where it was when I was born, though all my body has been woven of new stuff time after time, so through the ghost of the unquiet father, the image of the unliving son looks forth. In the intense instant of imagination, when the mind, Shelley says, is a fading cold, that which I was is that which I am and that which in possibility I may come to be. The Joycean I, capital I, ego, is there at the moment of creation. So the solution lies in the constant weaving and unweaving in the moments of creation. This is very clear in the case of Whitkin, who speaks of his long nights of suffering in his dark room as he scratches, scratches and scrapes and fashions the negative. Of course, to say that he suffers the solution is to say that he enjoys it. The ego is constructed at the level of the real. <coughs> now we can see what makes this ego so radically different. It has nothing to do with the unconscious. Neither Joyce nor Wittgen help themselves with the help of the unconscious. You can see that we have left behind the world of psychoanalysis and the Oedipal law. Lacan claims that Joyce succeeds in raising the ego to the power of language without, for all that, anything being analyzed. So I'm familiar, shall I start again? Yes, there is one at the back. <laughs> sorry, which, which, sorry, which space of the imagination? Sorry, Kirsten, I'm still unsure about the first half of it. It's a, a space that I didn't talk about. You're referring to some... <laughs> I don't know what it is. <laughs> um, would you like to characterize the first space, just in a sentence? Um, 
I'm not going to do it via the digital. I can't think about the digital in these terms. I think I might want to do it via comparing Joyce and Wittgen to the psychotic. I mean, not comparing. I'm just going to make a very poor schematic statement. Um, someone, I don't know if it was Lacan or Colette Soler, talks about Joyce auto-preventing psychosis. So the idea is that the, uh, the art of, of Joyce, uh, since, according to Lacan, he was totally unanalyzable anyway, is what saves him from psychosis. Uh, so he produces his own unique solution, but it is not a solution in the symbolic. It's not just that there is this one man you know, with his own private symbolic. It is that the solution lies in, the, in this activity of creation. And perhaps if it can stay awake all night scratching, you know, it really tells you that's where he feels better. Involved in that activity, which is not about meaning, which is not about building a symbolic, but which is actually fabricating this photographic skin, this ego, i.e. fabricating himself into a capital I. It's not a body ego. It is a capital I. Uh, I, I don't know that Tony can link back to this issue. Well, before, before you go, could I ask a question about on the one hand, uh, a certain mechanism No, I, I, I don't think you put it that way. Um, because you'd have to <laughs> because I think you'd have to characterize and and delineate what what was involved in work, right? So it's a bit of a cheat because you really have to to, to spell out what's involved in the work. And I think that what we're you see we're, we are relying on very very late Lacanian theory in which the symbolic now um, is not just the signifier but is. Um, it coexists with the jouissance that is to be found in the signifier. So there's no such thing as a, as a pure symbolic. And so what one is saying about Joyce's writing is that the meaning is neither here nor there. It, it doesn't add up to meaning, in fact. Uh, what is important in that is like a chain of jouissance, if you like. It's not producing your normal chain of signifiers that, that, that yields you imaginary meaning. Uh, it is actually being utilized at, on the jouissance side of the signifier. And it's the nature of that activity, right? And I don't think the, your, your workers beavering away are doing that. They're, ma they're trying to make their own sense, they're working harder and harder, but they're working within the same system. This is actually to say that these people are not working with the system of the unconscious. They're working at the level of the real. And all one can do is really point, right? You can't really theorize this. I mean, you, you, you build up what Lacan said about Joyce, you buy into it or you don't buy into it. But it seems to me, and, and Lacan doesn't talk about space uh, in relation to Joyce, but it seems to me that it describes something of that very rigid, not just um, the thick surface, but the rigidity of, of the Joel Peter Wittgen, it seems to me has to do with this kind of knotting that I'm suggesting takes place, which is, of course, Lacan's idea of the saint anne which is a different kind of knotting than you get when you take, when you relate to the name of the father and the paternal name.
Hi, I understand what you're saying about the relationship between a, a certain type of process and um, a Lacanian understanding of écriture. But what seems to be missing in the argument is um, is, is uh, I don't understand the reason that you're kind of essentializing Witkin's subject matter, in a sense. There seems to be, in this relationship between a process, a kind of work that Mark Cousins is talking about, and a kind of psychotic redemption, in a sense, and the actual content, ma co content of Witkin's work. Could you say a little bit more about the, the relationship of the content? Um, yes, I can't explain it but I know what propositions I want to make about it. Uh, one of the things that I, I will show you some more slides because um, my, sorry. Is it not still in, Joe? Oh God, you know there are 20 slides in there. <laughs> uh, because um, I, I, I have four slides that I find deeply affecting, um, which is one of the reasons for working on this. Because what I, what I, Keep going. Sorry, those are the ones of the fetuses. Okay, I can. One, one. The next four. That's called the feast of fools. This was in London uh, recently, in uh, the Anna Fagiinov exhibition. This is called Woman with Blue Hat. I don't think it's in color. And that's called Woman on the Table. Um, what I felt was that more than any other that I've ever seen, this material rubbed one in the I don't know how else to do it. Because the minute you talk about representation again, it comes to the In a sense, when I'm talking about the level of the real, there is some way in which the way we are going So on the question, I suppose, of, of life and death and, and tomb and womb, um, when you were speaking, I was thinking about Kristeva and her discussion about melancholia, which she describes as um, being a sort of living death. And she also has, uses an architectural metaphor for it. She describes it as the, the crypt of inexpressible affect. And in a way, the artwork itself becomes a way of breaking out of that sort of living death and sort of engaging with the other. And so it has that sort of potential... Um, you know, role of actually bringing life rather than death. That was one point. The other thing I was, I, did, did you say that the name of the, of, of the, the characters in, in Joyce are the surname Daedalus? Yes. Well, that's an interesting question because you know, Daedalus was, of course, the first ever architect. He designed the tomb of, uh, so of a minor <laughs> and, had a, you know, right, and had an interesting sort of relationship with his, with, his, with his son, who, of course, mm -hmm. died. You know, whatever. But again, when you say that the, the one effect of the artwork is that you might have really, the whole point is that's, n that's precisely not the outcome. That is not how this art functions. I think that's precisely to say it doesn't belong to any of those spaces that we are familiar with. And I, I forgot to, to elaborate just a little bit on what the difference is with psychosis, because the psychotic, although his imaginary has collapsed, although the name of the father is not in place, is in a sense desperately through his delusions attempting to put that name of the father 
There's no such attempt in the case of Joyce and Joel Peter Bitkin. Do, do you see what I mean by, by breaking the frame altogether? The psychotic is within the Oedipal frame in that sense. I mean, failed, but within it. I'm not sure if I understood your argument about uh, him not being analyzable. Was that because uh, you said earlier that uh, the subject of Witkin exists within the photograph and they can't speak to the analyst? Or you no, know, I, I was quoting Lockhart saying that Joyce mm -hmm. was not somebody who could have been. I thought you were probably implicitly saying that. Do you believe that as well? Or I'm, I <laughs> had a Joyce scholar. <laughs> like, I, I don't really want to. No, I'm. To uh, comment on I was just wondering if, if the argument. That um, artists who, as Witkin or Joy, uh, project their uh, their um, being as a, as a subject in their work are not analyzable. It's very difficult. I don't really like talking about artists, and I've been forced to, obviously, <laughs> if I'm following Locke on Joyce. But if you if we take uh, Finnegan's Wake, I think that um, of course there are millions of scholars beaver beavering away in libraries precisely putting together um, all the things that look terribly like the unconscious is very important here, right? Homo homophobes and this, that, and the other bits of meaning and bits of sense floating about. But that's not what Finnegan's Wake's about. And uh, Lachman says the joke is uh, really on those uh, people because it's the psychotic normally tries to unravel an enigma. Joyce has set one and left all these millions of PhDs, <laughs> students, uh, you know, to behave like psychotics, trying to unravel the enigma. And it's precisely then to say that the text doesn't really do it. Mm -hmm. But that's not where it's at. And I like this story, and I don't know if it's pertinent, but uh, somebody lent me, um, there are apparently 19 CDs of the whole of Finnegan's Wake being read by some maybe Irishman. I would lent the first one. I listened to five minutes and burst into tears. I tried it again and did exactly the same thing. And what it was, was the overpowering Thompson, because the voice actually brings out all those possible relations and the turn of interpretation and so on, and then, then that absolute conviction that it wasn't there. And it's, it's deeply upsetting. It's actually deeply upsetting. Uh, does that answer your question at all? It's not at the level you asked it. Yeah, Lawrence. interested in a or less thoughtful way, interested in a, <laughs> I mean, um, no, sometimes academic is a kind of an insult, you say it's academic, it's an insult. Um, I didn't mean it that way. Um, and, and that is that, that these are actually tableaus which he had to set up first or cajole the people like that lady without the legs to sit on the table or something if she's still alive. So he either has to set up these still lives or cajole people to act in them and then take the photo. So, He's not just a photographer. There is a strange way in which he's a kind of a, um, either an architect or a stage set designer or something as well. And it occurred to me that that means that on some level he's actually dealing with space the way, I'm not going to say real space, just ordinary space the way, you know, you and I and everyone in this room and in particular architects have to deal with it. And I was thinking that perhaps this kind of, that the description you had of what he does to the photographic surface after he's taken the photograph seems to me to be uh, just in the way he's sort of insists incessantly polishing that thing. Perhaps it's a way of trying to reassert the fact that this really is representation after all to say no, in fact, it's not 3D space. It is only a photograph. Not reassuring us, but reassuring himself. And that might be one aspect of, of, of this kind of ego building, non-imaginary ego building. Not symbolic ego but, but hang on, the way you're using um, three dimensional space, um, I'm talking about it uh, as a psychic of relations, so you either inhabit three dimensional space or you don't. Right. Um, so if you doesn't inhabit it, I'm not, not sure 
whining is going to be a really short about this. <laughs> or, or, or that that's what's happening at home. Uh, he's, when I started with that quotation uh, from him, which um, I've got somebody else's, I've got Cordonis. Uh, I am the work that I help to create. I mean, I'm starting from that. And I'm not sure where you're reading, how you're reading would relate to that claim, which I'm taking very yeah. seriously. Well, I'm, I'm not sure either, really. I, I, I was just thinking in this very sort of almost common sense way that actually he is setting up spaces, which means that his relationship to them is not the same as most photographers who are not so actively constructing the spaces that they take photographs of. Okay, I've I mean that as a comment. I leave that as a yeah. comment. Was, wasn't that one? I think it's it. One more. One more. You talked a lot about the relationship of the artist uh, to the, the work they created, like Pitkin or or Joyce. And um, what what does that then um, mean for us as viewer, viewers or readers of, of that work? Our relationship to the work. You know what I mean? Yes, I know what you mean. Uh, I've I, again, I've merely made a statement, which is uh, that I think that we are uh, get trapped in this tomb-like space that that, that he has. Produced. I think my interest in it is really, there's a lot of talk, and I'm a little suspicious of it, a lot of talk about the collapse of the farm. Right? And both the sociological element also within uh, psychoanalytic uh, Lacanian uh, circles. And so, in a sense, what, what I, why I think I was doing this work was to try and explore what happens when that paternal metaphor fails. And I don't want to say psychoanalysis then fails, uh, or there is that there is no space, but there is in the first place a space that will look very deforming to us. And the job of the victim introduces us as viewers into that highly deformed, non 